Hi, my name is Johannes. I'm a research intern for IBM Quantum, and I'm going to talk to you today about the Quantum Approximate Optimization Algorithm, or QAOA, and its applications. And so let me give you a brief overview of the content of this lecture. Uh, first of all, I'm going to talk about variational quantum eigensolvers. These are variational quantum algorithms that try to approximate the ground state of quantum systems. And we will see later on in the lecture that QAOA can actually be seen as a special case of VQEs. Then in the second part of the talk, I'm going to introduce the kind of problems that QAOA can solve. In particular, these are quadratic unconstrained binary optimization problems, or QBOs for short. And we will look specifically at one particular kind of problem class, which is called MaxCut. Then in the third section, I'm going to show you how the QAOA circuit actually looks like in detail. In section number four, we will learn about the connection between QAOA and adiabatic quantum computing. And then at the very end, I'll give you a brief overview of recent results and some caveats of the algorithm. Okay, so let's start with the first topic, which are variational quantum eigensolvers. So before we can understand what the VQE does in detail, we need to um, get a few definitions out of the way. So let's talk about Hamiltonians. A Hamiltonian is just an operator corresponding to the total energy of a given quantum system. And it's described by a Hermitian matrix H. Hermitian, Hermitian means that it's just the same as its conjugate transpose. So you might remember that a quantum system in general is always uh, described by a vector in a complex Hilbert space. And we usually denote these vectors in the ket notation, as you can see here. Now, the energy of a system in the state psi uh, is given by the expectation value of that vector psi with respect to the matrix H. So basically what is written here. The ground state of a quantum system is then the lowest energy state. So basically the vector in the Hilbert space for which this expectation value becomes lowest. Okay, with this, we can understand the variational method. The variational me method is a method for approximating the ground state psi star and the lowest energy E of a quantum system. And it basically consists of two steps. In the first step, we choose an ansatz or trial state parameterized by some parameters theta. And so what you can imagine, instead of looking at the full Hilbert space describing all the possible quantum states, we only look at a subspace of this Hilbert space, which is parameterized by exactly these parameters theta. Then in the second step, what we do is we vary these parameters theta in order to minimize the energy value. So we're trying to find the, uh, the parameters theta star for which the energy of our trial state becomes lowest. Now, since the ground state by definition is the um, minimal energy state, any such energy value gives us an upper bound for the actual minimal energy. And furthermore, if we find the parameters theta for which this energy of the trial state becomes lowest, we automatically approximate the ground state psi star. And so naturally, the choice of ansatz or trial state is very important for the, vari for the variational method to work. And so one possible choice is to parameterize our quantum state by a variational quantum circuit. A variational quantum circuit in the most general sense is just a quantum circuit that depends on some parameters theta. So you can see an example in the picture that is here. Um, this quantum circuit contains some general uh, gates, as you've seen before, the Hadamard gate or some CNOT gates, and it also contains some parameterized rotational gates. So you might remember that in a rotational gate, we always have a rotation angle. And instead of fixing that angle to one numerical value, what we can do is we can instead plug in a parameter theta. And so in this way, we obtain a quantum circuit that is actually dependent on parameters. And we now use this quantum circuit um, in order to prepare a trial state or ansatz state. And this is exactly the idea behind variational quantum eigensolvers. So again, we want to prepare a quantum state with a variational quantum circuit. And this is basically how we obtain our ansatz state. Now, the variational quantum eigensolver updates the parameters theta by first running the variational quantum circuit on a quantum computer. This then gives us some measurements of the energy value, 
which we can use to plug in a classical optimizer, and the classical optimizer will simply update the parameters for us. And so in this way, we get this hybrid quantum classical feedback loop where we use the quantum computer only to measure the uh, value of the energy, and we use the classical optimizer to optimize our parameters or our circuit parameters. Okay, so to recap, the VQE uses the variational method to approximate the ground state of a Hamiltonian, and it does so by using a classical quantum hybrid loop to optimize circuit parameters. Now, for those of you who are familiar with classical neural networks, you might see that there is some similarity here. Um, usually in the setting of classical neural networks, we also have this network, which is kind of a black box, a parameterized black box that for some input parameters gives us some fixed output. And we use an optimizer to update the, the parameters uh, iteratively. And this is actually exactly the setting of the variational quantum eigensolver, only now the neural network has been replaced by a variational circuit. Now, as I've mentioned before, the choice of our trial state is extremely important for this method to work. And so there are a number of different variational forms out there, but there are some techniques that you will encounter in many of them. Um, for example, layerized or tensor network circuits. And we will actually see that the QAOA is also a layerized variational form. Now, in general, we can use the variational quantum eigensolver whenever we want to find the ground state of a Hamiltonian. And so naturally, it has a lot of applications in chemistry and quantum mechanics, where often we have a given Hamiltonian and we want to find the exact ground state. But we can also use it for optimization. And the idea here is that we, if we have a given optimization problem, we want to encode it as a Hamiltonian, uh, such that the ground state actually corresponds to the optimal solution of that problem. And in that way, we can then use the variational quantum eigensolver to find the optimal solution. And this is the idea that's also at the heart of QAOA. This brings us to the kind of problems that we are able to solve with QAOA. These are called quadratic unconstrained binary optimization problems. And so to begin with, let's look at quadratic programs, which are a bit more general. A quadratic program is an optimization problem with a quadratic objective function and linear and quadratic constraints. What this means is that we can write the optimization problem in the form that is written to the right here. So basically we want to minimize or maximize a quadratic expression. Um, so in this expression here, Q corresponds to a real valued N times N A matrix and C corresponds to a um, real valued vector. And we'd, we would like to find the vector X, which minimizes this expression. And the variables X might be subject to some constraints, which can be linear, quadratic, or simply um, limiting the range of values that X can take. Now, we are interested in the special case of quadratic unconstrained binary optimization problems, or QBOS for short. As the name already says, um, quadratic means we're dealing with a quadratic objective function again. Unconstrained means we don't have any variable constraints, so the constraints that we had in the general case of the quadratic program um, we can ignore now. And then binary means we're dealing with binary optimization variables, so the vector x can only take values uh, in 0 or 1. Right, and these are exactly the kind of problems that we are going to solve with QAOA. Now, one specific problem class that we can always formulate as QBOS is the problem class of MaxCut. So first of all, for all of you who are not familiar with graph theory, a graph is basically just a set of vertices or nodes V depicted on the right here as blue circles connected by a set of edges E. So these are the gray lines between the nodes you can see on the right. Um, and these edges can be weighted, so we can assign numeric values to these edges, or it can be unweighted, in which case we just give every edge the weight one. Now, a cut of a graph is simply a partition of the vertices into two disjoint subsets. As an example, consider the picture on the right where we have partitioned the vertices into a set of light blue and dark blue vertices. The weight of a given cut is then simply the weight, the cumulative weight of all the edges that connect vertices from different sets. So again, on the right here, you can see that we marked in red all the edges that connect um, vertices from the different sets. And so in total, these are six edges and the weight of this cut would simply be six. 
Right now in the max cap problem, we are given as input a positively weighted graph G and uh, the output we want to get is the maximal cut. Now, if we identify um, each set or that we partition the, the set of vertices in either with the number zero or the number one, then every cut of this graph can be represented by an n-dimensional vector that takes values in zero or one. Uh, you can see an example on the right here. And so what we are dealing with here is a binary optimization problem because we're trying to find the optimal vector X that maximizes our cost function. And in fact, we can always formulate max cut problems as Cubo instances. So assume we are given a graph with a given uh, with a specific weight matrix. So this matrix simply includes all the weights of the different edges that are in the graph. Then it turns out that we can write the cost function for the max cut problem as is written down here. So basically the sum over all wij times xi times one minus xj. And you can very easily see that this is true since um, in this expression down here, every, every edge weight wij only, co um, only contributes to the sum if and only if xi and xj take different values. And so when we take a look at the cost function, we immediately see that this is a quadratic objective. And we can actually reformulate this in the standard form for cubos. And what we get is the general cubo cost function where the cubo matrix is simply the negative weight matrix of the graph. And the cubo vector C is given as the sum of the rows in the weight matrix. So let me give you an idea of classical limitations in the setting of MaxCut. Um, first of all, we've just seen that any MaxCut instance can be formulated as a Cubo instance. And the reverse is actually also true. Any general Cubo can also be turned into a MaxCut instance by, by introducing a slack variable. Now, for classical algorithms, it's been shown that it's NP-hard to achieve a better approximation ratio than 0.941 approximately. And so what this means is that there exists no classical algorithm that runs in polynomial time, which in the worst case gets a solution which is as good as 0 0.941 um, of the optimal solution. In fact, you can also show a stronger statement, namely that under the unique games conjecture, um, the best classical approximation ratio is approximately 0 0.878. And actually there exists a classical algorithm which already achieves this approximation ratio, which is called the Gilman's Williamson algorithm. And this algorithm works by relaxing the problem into a continuous um, variable problem. So instead of allowing binary values zero and one, we also allow continuous values ranging anywhere from zero to one. And then this actually makes it much easier to solve the problem. Uh, the corresponding continuous solution can then be rounded again to a binary solution. And uh, that's the main idea behind the algorithm. And to date, it gives us the best classical approximation ratio, which is possible under the unique games conjecture. Of course, it's not known whether the unique games conjecture actually holds. Okay, so we've just seen that any max cut instance can be formulated as a Cubo. And I've already told you that QAOA um, is able to solve Cubo instances. And the way we do that is that we formulate Cubo instances uh, or we encode Cubo instances in a Hamiltonian problem. So we want to find a Hamiltonian operator that encodes our cost function C. What this means is in the setting of Cubo, every bit string X can be identified with a computational basis state of our quantum system. So with a computational basis state X. And now when we apply the operator HC, or we're looking for an operator HC, that when applied to this computational basis set X, gives us the actual value of the cost function C of X. Now for a general Cubo cost function, it turns out that there exists a Hamiltonian operator which does exactly that. And the expression for this operator is written on the right here, um, but I'm going to show you real quick how we can actually derive at that expression. Okay, so we are trying to find a Hamiltonian HC that will encode our cost function. And to do so, we can use the following relation. If we apply a Pauli Z gate 
to our computational basis state x, then the outcome of that is either minus one if xi is one, or, uh, or one if xi is zero. So in other words, it's minus one to the power of xi. We can also re rewrite this as one minus two xi. But this means if we um, reorder these terms, what we get is that the identity operation minus the poly zi operator over two applied to the computational basis state x yields xi. And so we can use this relation um, and basically just plug this into the cost function above in order to get our Hamiltonian hc. And so if we do just that, then we first of all sum over um, all the quadratic terms. So qij times one minus zi over two times one minus zj over two. And then come the linear terms in our cost function. Um, and when I write one here, what I mean is the identity operator. Okay, we can expand this. And so let's begin by collecting all the constant terms. We get the sum over the qij over four from the um, from the first part of the sum here. And we also get a sum over ci over two. Now let's collect all the terms with the single Pauli z gates. This should actually be a minus, sorry. So again, from the um, first part of the sum, we get the following term. And we get the same with i and j reversed. And then last but not least, we also get a term from the linear part of the cost function. And then at the very end, we can collect the interaction terms, so all terms that include multiple Pauli Z operators. Right, so the only thing left to do now is basically to pool the terms of the single um, Pauli Z operators together. And what we get is the expression from the presentation slide. Okay, so we've just learned how to encode any general Kubo cost function as a Hamiltonian operator. And this finally brings us to the QAOA circuit. As a brief overview, the quantum approximate optimization algorithm was first introduced in 2014 by Farhi, Goldstone, and Gutmann. And as I've mentioned a number of times now, it finds approximate solutions for Kubo instances. It can be regarded as a special case of the variational quantum eigensolver. And again, as I've mentioned before, the idea is to encode the cost function of an optimization problem as a problem Hamiltonian HC, and then use the variational method to find the ground state of that Hamiltonian, which should correspond to the optimal solution of the optimization problem. Now, the variational form of the QAOA is a layerized quantum circuit, which is based on a trotterized adiabatic process. And if you don't know what these words mean, don't worry about it. I'm going to go into more detail about this in the next section. But first of all, let's look at the QAOA variational form. Okay, so at the very beginning of the variational form, we apply Hadamard gates to every single qubit. What this does it is it basically prepares the um, equal superposition state. So you might recall that if we apply a Hadamard state, Hadamard gate 
to a qubit that is in the zero state, it will be put in an equal superposition of the zero and one state. And if we apply single Hadamard gates to all qubits in this line, it basically has the same effect. We create an equal superposition of all possible computational basis states. Then in the next step, we apply P layers of the QAO circuit, where each layer consists of a cost layer, which are depicted here in light blue, and of a mixer layer, which are depicted in purple here. The cost layers are parameterized by parameters that we call gamma, um, and the mixer layers are parameterized by parameters beta. And every cost layer is basically the exponentiation of a of our cost Hamiltonian, whereas the mixer layer is the exponential of a mixer Hamiltonian. And um, I will go into a bit more detail about matrix exp exponentiation and how these um, Hamiltonians look like in the next slides. And then at the very end, we simply measure in the computational basis. And so this is the high level overview for the QAOA variation form. Okay, so to understand the uh, different layers of the QAOA circuit, we need to know a little bit about matrix exponentiation. And so really all you need to know here is that for a given matrix, we can also define its exponential. And this is done analogously to the um, standard exponential function with a series. And um, what's important for us now is that if we take the Pauli matrices X, Y, and Z, um, and we exponentiate them, what we obtain are basically the corresponding rotational gates. So if we exponentiate the Pauli X matrix um, with a prefactor of minus I and some parameter theta, then what we get is the rotational X gate with rotation angle two times theta. And the same holds for the Pauli Y matrix and the Pauli Z matrix. And so, with this, we are able to understand what the QAOA cost layer looks like. So remember the cost Hamiltonian that we derived in uh, the calculations I did just a few minutes ago uh, looked like this. Now, what happens if we exponentiate this Hamiltonian? Basically, all the single Z gates or the single Pauli Z gates turn into rotational Z gates. And the angle that we use for these rotational Z gates is the same as the prefactor of these single Pauli Z gates in the first expression. Um, when we exponentiate these interaction terms where we basically have two Pauli Z operators, what we get is a so-called RZZ gate. And what this is, is it's basically just a controlled single rotational gates. So if we look at the RZZ gate that is here applied to qubit zero and qubit two, you can imagine that this is just a rotational Z gate on qubit two controlled on qubit zero. And in this manner, we uh, already obtain the QAOA cost layer. We basically have a number of single rotational gates applied to each single qubit. And then we have for each interaction term in our cost Hamiltonian, a RZZ gauge, which is applied to a qubit pair. The mixer layer of the QAOA actually looks a lot simpler. Um, as the mixer Hamiltonian, we usually, uh, or in the standard QAOA at least, the mixer layer is defined as the sum over all Pauli X operators. And we've already seen in the last slides that when we take the exponential of the Pauli X operator, we get a rotational X gate. And so what this means is that the mixer layer of the QAOA simply um, consists of rotational X gates applied to each single qubit and parameterized by this parameter beta. Okay, and this brings us finally to the uh, full QAOA circuit. Um, here you can see an example for a fully connected MaxCut problem with five vertices. And so again, in the very beginning, we apply Hadamard gates to every single qubit, which prepares the equal superposition state, then follows the QAOA cost layer. The RZZ gates in this layer have um, been decomposed in this picture, um, each into two C0 gates and one single rotational gate. So every combination, of, every combination of three such gates, you can see as a single RZZ gate. And so since this is a fully connected problem, we have RZZ gates between every possible qubit pair in the circuit. And then after the cost layer, we have the um, 
the mixer layer, which consists of single rotational Rx gates. And then at the very end, we measure in the computational basis. Now, as you've seen in the beginning, if we go back a few slides, uh, this is a layerized circuit. So what you just saw on the other slide was a circuit with one single layer. However, if we, we can adapt the depth of QAOA as we want, so we can add as many layers as we'd like. And so basically what this would look like is just a repetition of the same circuit multiple times behind each other. Um, again, note that every single layer in the QAOA circuit is parameterized by one single parameter. So every cost layer um, is parameterized by one gamma parameter, and every mixer layer is parameterized by one beta, beta parameter. So if the full QAOA has depth P, which means that we apply these two layers a total number of P times, then the total number of parameters that we need to optimize for equals 2P. Okay, just to give you a quick overview of the complete QAOA optimization process again, um, to make sure that we understand every step that's involved here. So again, we start with a QAOA circuit for a given problem Hamiltonian, and we start with some initial parameters theta. We can then run the circuit on a quantum computer and measure the outcomes. What we get through these measurements is a number of bit string samples. So a number of bit strings xi, which correspond to, correspond to cuts for our max cut problem. We can then evaluate the values of these cuts and take the mean of it. And the mean of these cut values gives us a cost function for the parameters theta. We then feed this cost function to a classical optimizer and the classical optimizer updates our parameters and calls the quantum circuit again, and then this whole process um, repeats. And so the uh, quantum computer basically just executes a quantum circuit and gives the um, evaluates the cost function for the classical optimizer to minimize or maximize. So to give you an example of what these cost functions look like, here's an example for a QAOA energy landscape for a max cut instance of size five. And so you can see that on the X and Y axis, we have the parameters beta and gamma, and then the height of the function basically gives us the energy of the trial state for the corresponding parameters. Now, the first thing we can see here is that the energy landscape is periodic both in beta and gamma. And this is because we are using rotational gates in our variational form. Um, and, very, and rotational gates themselves are periodic with a periodicity of two pi. And this periodicity is also reflected in the parameters beta and gamma here. Now, you might also be able to see that between these uh, very large global optima, we have some maxima and minima that are much worse, but there's actually a lot of them in this landscape. And there exists an, a number of algorithmic adaptations that allow us to smoothen out the QAOA energy landscape. And in fact, I will talk about uh, um, a bit about this in the last section of the lecture. Now, one thing to take away from this is that the classical optimizer is very important for the success of QAOA. Um, and actually in the next lab session, you will have the option to play around with different optimizers and different initial points and see how these choices actually affect the optimization process in QAOA. And we will see that if we choose a very bad initial point or a bad optimizer, we won't get, uh, we won't find the global optimum and get worse results than if we pick very good values. Okay, so you've now learned what the basic structure of QAOA looks like, but why did we actually choose this variational form? To understand this, we need to talk about adiabatic quantum computing. And so let's go back to our Hamiltonian. We've already learned that the Hamiltonian um, represents the energy of the quantum system. However, with the Schrodinger equation, um, However, the Schrodinger equation also tells us that the time evolution of a quantum system is also governed by, a Hamil by the Hamiltonian age. Um, and so the Schrodinger equation is written here, but the key takeaway from this is, say we have a quantum system that initially starts in the state psi zero, and we would like to know what the quantum, 
what, what the system looks like after a time t has passed, then all we need to do in theory is exponentiate the Hamiltonian h and apply the corresponding operator to our initial state. And what we get is the quantum state after time t. So we will see in a bit how this relates to QAOA. Another thing we will need is the adiabatic theorem. And the adiabatic theorem states the following. Say we have a quantum system that is in its ground state and described by a Hamiltonian H0. Then if we change this Hamiltonian slowly enough and transition to another Hamiltonian H1, the system will actually remain, remain in its ground state. And this is not only true for the ground state, but also for higher energy states. So you can imagine uh, a system starting with a very simple Hamiltonian H0 uh, and the system being in the ground state, and then slowly transitioning from this simple Hamiltonian to a more complicated one. If we do this transition slowly enough, then the system will remain in the ground state. And this is the idea behind adiabatic quantum computing. So in adiabatic quantum computing, what we do is, first of all, we encode our problem as a Hamiltonian whose ground state corresponds to the problem solution. And we've already seen how to do that for Kubo instances. It's the same idea that we use in order to apply QAOA. Then what we do is we prepare a quantum system in the ground state of a very simple Hamiltonian. So we take a simple Hamiltonian where we know what the ground state looks like, and we prepare that state. And then in the last step, we adiabatically evolve from the simple Hamiltonian to our problem Hamiltonian. Um, adiabatically here means that we just transition very slowly. Then by the adiabatic theorem, we will remain in the ground state of the problem Hamiltonian, and this will give us the solution for our original problem. So that's the, uh, the key idea behind adiabatic quantum computing. Now we need one more concept to see how this relates to QAOA, and this is the concept of trotterization. Consider now a problem Hamiltonian HC that consists um, of a sum of two different Hamiltonians, H1 and H2. We've just learned on the previous slides that if we want to determine the time evolution operator, so we want to see how our quantum system evolves in time, we need to exponentiate this Hamiltonian. And so we need to get the exponential of a sum of matrices. Now, if two matrices A and B commute, it turns out that E to the power of A plus B is the same as E to the power of A times E to the power of B. So we can just exponentiate each of these matrices individually and take the product. However, this is not the case for general matrices. This only holds if A and B commute. And so in the general case, what we can do is we can use an approximation, approximation given by the Trotter suzuki formula. And this approximation is written below here. So if we take the ex exponential um, of a matrix H1 plus H2, um, what we can do instead to approximate this exponential is take the product of E to the power of the first matrix divided by some factor R, times the exponential of the second matrix divided by some factor r, and take this whole product to the power of r. Applied to the setting of time evolution, what this means is if we want to evolve by a problem Hamiltonian HC, that is the sum of two individual Hamiltonians, we can um, alternatingly evolve by each of the single Hamiltonians uh, only by a much smaller time slice. So first evolve the system only a little bit with Hamiltonian H1, then again with H2, again with H1, H2, and so on. And by following this procedure, we eventually approximate the time evolution by the uh, sum of these operators, where the approximation is better, the higher we choose, um, we choose this factor R to be. So the more slices of um, individual time evolutions we apply. Okay, so you might already see where this is going, but this leads us to the QAOA as an adiabatic schedule. And so recall again that in the setting of QAOA, we have these two Hamiltonians, the cost Hamiltonian HC, which encodes our problem, and the mixer Hamiltonian HM. And now imagine we do an adiabatic evolution between these two Hamiltonians. So we start out with the mixer Hamiltonian for t equals zero, and as t grows larger and eventually reaches um, 
this runtime large T, we end up in the cost Hamiltonian HC. Now, if we do this transition slowly enough in an adiabatic, uh, in an adiabatic way, um, and we start in the ground state of the mixer Hamiltonian, we know that we will end up in the ground state of the cost Hamiltonian. And the same is also true for higher energy states. Now, it turns out that the individual layers of Q QAOA actually correspond to trotterized segments of the time evolution operator for this adiabatic evolution. Furthermore, if we um, take a look at the initial state that we start in, in the QAOA, uh, recall that this is the equal superposition state. And also recall that the mixer Hamiltonian is um, usually chosen as the sum of Pauli X operators. Now, if we take a look at the eigenvectors of uh, the Pauli X matrix, one of them is the equal superposition state. And it turns out that the initial QAOA state is actually the highest energy state of our mixer Hamiltonian. And so we start out in the highest energy state of the mixer Hamiltonian, and we basically follow a trotterized version of the quantum adiabatic schedule, which leaves us at the very end in a very high energy state of our cost Hamiltonian. Now we have to be a bit careful here because previously I said we're trying to approximate the ground state of HC uh, instead of the highest energy state. But in fact, this, is, um, this corresponds simply to a change of sign in HC. And so by viewing the QAOA as an adiabatic schedule, we actually get a performance guarantee in the limit of P to infinity. So first of all, um, if we denote by MP the best possible value that our QAOA, QAOA circuit um, can obtain at depth P, then we know that the value for a deeper QAOA circuit is always at least as good as the value of a less deep QAOA circuit. And the reason for this is that by increasing the depth of QAOA, we only increase the subspace of the, um, of the Hilbert space that our trial state lives in. And so we, if we actually find the global optimum for a deeper QAOA circuit, it is always guaranteed to give us a better energy value than the um, optimal at a lower depth. And then furthermore, with the um, adiabatic theorem, we also get the guarantee that in the limit for P to infinity, we will obtain the best value for our optimization problem. Now, this gives us some idea as to why the QLA variational form was chosen as it is, and also why it might produce good results. But it's important to keep in mind here that this is only a performance guarantee in the infinite limit of P and we don't have any guarantee for a finite P. Um, and again, if you compare this to a classical algorithm, if you imagine a classical algorithm running for an infinitely long time, of course, this would also be able to solve most optimization problems. Okay, so this brings us to the last section of the lecture where I will talk about some recent results in the field of QAOA and some caveats of the algorithm. So as I've mentioned before, if we view the QAOA through the lens of variational quantum eigensolvers, um, then we don't have any performance guarantees. So we don't know if the solutions that are obtained by QAOA uh, will actually be good solutions. Now, it's important to note here that there are actually other ways than the variational method to find parameters for the QAOA circuit. For example, in the original paper, where QAOA was introduced, Farhi shows that for specific MaxCut instances, we can pre-compute the optimal values for beta and gamma, and then we only have to plug these into the quantum circuit. Um, I will also talk about the topic of parameter concentration in a couple of slides, where a similar idea can be used to warm start um, QAOA with certain good parameters. Now, in 2019, it was shown that QAOA requires at least super logarithmic depth in order to beat the classical Gimmons Williamson algorithm. And so, in more detail, if the QAOA has depth P that grows um, sublogarithmically in the size of the problem, then the best approximation ratio that we can get is lower than 5 over 6 um, plus some inverse in the degree of the the graph. So D here corresponds to the degree of the graph we're looking at. And so this is worse than the classical Gimmons-Williamson algorithm. 
Then in, also in 2019, Hastings used uh, the setting of local classical algorithms um, to compare QAOA2. And a local classical algorithm basically starts out with a solution for MaxCut and then updates each single um, each single entry in that solution. So each each single entry in the bit string vector by looking only at the nearest neighbors of that um, of that vertex in the corresponding graph. And so he showed that there in the setting of local classical algorithms, there exists an algorithm that outperforms QAOA for depth p uh, equal to one. Um, now, this, however, is not super surprising because we expect QAOA only to lead to an advantage for large values of P. Uh, then other factors to keep in mind, especially when talking about near-term devices, is the fact of limited device connectivity. So if we look at the QAOA circuit for a fully connected problem, then the circuit includes interactions between any possible qubit pairs. If we want to execute this uh, circuit on a real hardware device, this means that we actually have to swap qubits around a lot um, and insert a lot of additional gates in order to execute this algorithm. Um, and then another factor is the increasing number of shots and iterations for increasing problem size, simply because the um, variance in different bit strings that we get when we sample the quantum computer um, increases with the increasing problem size as well. Now, there are a number of algorithmic adaptations that are supposed to speed up or improve the optimization process in QAOA. And one of these algorithmic adaptations is um, the use of the conditional value at risk introduced in 2020. And so uh, the idea behind this is that instead of looking at the mean of all the measured outcomes from our quantum circuit, we only take the best bit strings that we get and take the mean of those. And uh, the rationale behind this is if we um, consider optimization problems, we're only interested in one good solution. So it might not make sense to take the mean of all possible samples that we get, because what we're actually interested in is getting one good bit string that gives us a good solution for our original optimization problem. And so in the most extreme case, you can imagine considering only the best measurement outcome that we get for each possible set of parameters. Um, but here we run into problems of noise. And so often we use a trade of parameter alpha, which kind of tells us which uh, fraction of measurements we would like to choose. And then depending on alpha, it has been shown uh, that this can significantly improve the optimization process of uh, QAOA. Another idea introduced in 2020 is the idea of warm starting QAOA. And here what we do is we replace the initial state of QAOA, which in the um, original version of the algorithm is the equal superposition state, with a state that is obtained by some classical optimization procedure. So the warm starting state you can see um, is defined to the right here, where instead of creating the equal superposition, we apply very, um, rotational Y gates to each single qubit, um, which have as angles these parameters theta i. And these angles correspond to the solution um, of a continuous val valued relaxation of our problem instance. So if you recall how the Gumans williamson algorithm works, um, we first obtain a continuous valued solution for the same problem, and then we round this to binary values. And in a similar vein, what we do here is we take this continuous, uh, continuous value solution, which is very easy to obtain using classical optimizers, and we only use it to improve the initial state of our QAOA. And so we kind of give QAOA a head start by producing a state that is already close to um, a high energy state. Right, if we do this, we also have to replace the mixer Hamiltonian though, um, because we want to keep the initial state as the ground state or highest energy um, value state of the uh, mixer Hamiltonian. Okay, then uh, last but not least, I want to talk about parameter concentration. And it has been shown in multiple studies by now that the optimal parameters for QOA concentrate over different problem instances. So if we take a look at a set of 
different Mexical problems, for example, it turns out that the optimal parameters for the corresponding QAOI circuits do not differ very much. And so in 2020, it was shown that for the Sherrington Kirkpatrick model, which is a model of fully connected graphs, if we take a look at the um, infinite size limit, it turns out that the uh, QAOA becomes fully instance independent, or the optimal parameters rather become fully instance independent. So what this means is that the optimal parameters are the same no matter which problem instance we're looking at in the infinite size limit. Furthermore, in 2021, it has also been shown that um, parameters concentrate across problems of different problem size. And so these findings give rise to new optimization techniques for QAOA, because what we can do is, if parameters concentrate, we can use the optimal parameters we obtain for one problem instance and use them as starting values for the optimization process of another problem instance. Additionally, um, with the second result, um, where it was shown that parameter concentrate across problems of different problem size, we can also find optimal parameters for large problem instances by initially focusing on only a smaller subproblem of this problem. Okay, so I hope I was able to give you a good overview of some of the recent results in this field. Um, and then with the complete lecture, also a good introduction to QAOA in general. Um, and I hope to see you in the next lab session where you will be able to try out these things yourself and basically solve optimization problems yourself using the QAOA as implemented in Qiskit. And if you have any questions uh, concerning this lecture, I'll be happy to answer them in the following Q&A session.